uh, copy. So I'll I'll now uh, uh, I'll go through the whole uh, again just to because to uh, put us in perspective and uh, to not to let these things uh, uh, get uh, too much into our uh, head. Okay, so uh, basic A is that that we are doing we are meeting here to the first memorial lecture of our dear friend and colleague Professor Konkon Fatajaria. And you know, I was telling uh, about it, and I'll repeat it a little bit to set the ambience again. That Professor Bhattacharya was one of the most distinguished experimental physical chemists of this country, and uh, who achieved a lot. And as I was telling that, you know, he was uh, something which is not known uh, because I've known him for a very long time. That he is one of the most hardworking scientists. You know, I I, I used to talk. His wife used to com kinky complain to me how. Uh, Konkon would uh, come back at four o'clock and then uh, stay awake till uh, morning. His students used to send him back, uh, the sir go back home, uh, but he would not sleep there. Uh, so I asked Konkon, why is that? Konkon would say, okay, no, I'm very tense when experiment is going on. So that kind of dedication led to uh, considerable success in this, uh, his, uh, uh, his, uh, scientific accomplishments. He produced huge number of papers. He got elected to all the academies and got the Vartangar Award, became the vice president of INSA, senior uh, editor of uh, Journal of Physical Chemistry, IUPAC member. He just in name, you know, and he was a very important member of the community. He was an extremely important member of the community. He was in many committees. He was helping everybody. And he was one of the most generous person that we have seen around, you know, and, and scrupulously honest, scrupulously honest. And I must mention one thing that, you know, he, he was not really treated well by the system. And uh, all of us have certain grievance about it. And I hope that uh, we will be able to erase those things and go take it constructively and do a uh, scientific, uh, scientific uh, uh, thing. And as I also introduced a little bit briefly again, Professor Dix there, who is one of the most eminent scientists of our time. And one of us, Konkon, had great respect for. Uh, he elected to National Academy, American Academy Fellow of the Royal Society in England, and then every other thing, um, uh, Ulf Prize, National Medal of Science, uh, Wells Foundation Award, ACS, APS Awards. Uh, we are extremely kind and extremely happy that he showed the kindness to give the first memorial lecture, even in a very bad time in the morning. And we are uh, really grateful for him that, you know, and we really sincerely apologize what has happened. This has never happened before, um, but it was certainly hacked and some kind of way and we have a, but I think these kind of things we are not going to, uh, we are not going to certainly uh, um, tolerate it actually. It's not, not acceptable behavior. So we'll go ahead with the scientific program and I request Professor Dick there to uh, please start the lecture. Thank, thank you so, so, so much, uh, Professor Beeman Bakshi. Uh, I, I am delighted and honored to be delivering the first Kankan Bhattacharya Memorial Lecture. And he, here's a picture I took of him. And uh, this picture very much captures him because you'll notice how cheerful this person is. And he's always been that way when I've been around. Yes, uh, there's always adversity in some people's lives. But he not only treated things with a smile, but he loved showing to me anyways. And, and my daughter, uh, Bonnie, who was with me when we visited Calcutta, he enjoyed showing very much India. He took us to Shanti Nikatan and, and uh, just showed us all types of wonderful treats along the way. Here's yet some more pictures with him. Uh, I, I found him to be a great friend and a, a person that I so much enjoyed seeing. Uh, the last time I did see him was was in Bhopal, and, and uh, again his kindness and his very much uh, delight in everything around him came through uh, and, and uh, made a huge impression on me. Um, you know, I, I I'm told that everything that has a start unfortunately also has an end, and, and I will miss him very much but he really brightened all those who, who, who got to know him well. 
and uh, I, I'm sorry that he's no longer with us, and, uh, but his memory does carry on. Let me mention to you about cold collision steric effects. Okay, and anybody who wants a copy of this lecture can write me at this email address. Now, let me see if I can do something. I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna go laser pointer. And so here's my uh, uh, um, email address and uh, I respond to email pretty well. Uh, let's review steric effects and bimolecular collisions. Uh, these are things that uh, we, we, we know, but we sometimes forget. So we wanna determine the reaction rate, which I'll call Z for a gas phase bimolecular process. The, the canonical one, A plus B goes to C plus D, something like this. It's gonna be gas phase we have in mind. And uh, we assume that the reactant molecules are rigid. In fact, we take them as spheres, uncharged spheres that physically collide prior to reacting. Imagine two spheres colliding. Uh, we're gonna postulate that the majority of collisions do not lead to a reaction, but only those in which the colliding species have two things that work for them. Here are the two important considerations. A kinetic energy greater than a certain minimum. In other words, an activation energy. There are some reactions which require no activation energy, but most reactions require us to overcome some type of barrier. The second factor is the correct spatial orientation. We're gonna call this the steric factor rho with respect to each other. Molecules have geometry, and though I took it as a sphere, real molecules aren't spheres and they really have certain spots that come together better than others. And those the collisions that lead to reaction are called effective collisions. And the reaction rate is defined as the number of effective collisions per unit time. That's what we mean by the reaction rate. Um, now, as I say, two significant factors determine the reaction rates. Concentration, we all know, increase the concentration of our reagents, Okay, increase the collision frequency, and thus the effect of collision frequency also increases. That's the first idea. Second idea is temperature. The kinetic energy of particles follows the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. An increase in temperature not only increases the average speed of the reactant particles and the number of collisions, but also the fraction of, of particles having a kinetic energy higher than the activation energy. Thus, the effect is effective collision frequency increases. That's true to a point. If you get the temperature too, too high, of course, the molecule falls apart, but that's a very high temperature. But generally we expect the reactions to go up with temperature. And this simple-minded approach ignores how thermal activation so far also populates internal states, vibrational rotational levels of the molecule and how they affect the, the reaction collision. We're just forgetting about that right now in this very simple treatment that historically was put forward. And so let's go through this. And uh, th this is again in the form of a review. <coughs> so our two reactants, A and B will collide if they get close enough to one another. And the area around the mole molecule A, which it can collide with it, an approaching B molecule is called the cross section, okay, of the reaction. This area corresponds to a circle whose radius is the sum of the radii of both reacting. It breaks down, for example, if we really get involved in making a reaction in which there's an electron jump, then the size isn't simply the geometrical size uh, of the of the, the Adam, and we'll see that that does, I hope it's going to continue okay here for me. Um, so a, a moving molecule will sweep a volume. That volume will be P, P uh, pi times the RAB that I defined for you uh, squared. That's of course the volume of, that's the area of a circle times CA. What's CA? It's the average velocity of A relative to B. And it's given by this formula that I'm showing you uh, here. Um, where Kb is the Boltzmann constant and Ma is the mass of the molecule A. But two different moving bodies can be treated as one body, which has the reduced mass mu AB of both and moves with the velocity of the center of mass. Uh, we learn that, and thus we get this type of formula as shown here. 
That's the total collision frequency is given by this. Na is Avogadro's number. And uh, we have the concentrations A and B. Those are in moles. So we turn those into numbers by the, by the Avogadro's number. That's why it's squared. And we see the rest of it go through quite clearly. Like I've explained, here's the cross section, which we've taken this very simple picture. This is our ZAB. Okay, good. So far, yeah. fine. That's what people first started to figure out. And from the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, it can be deduced that the fraction of collisions with more energy than the activation energy is an uh, uh, exponential of minus the EA over KBT. And that's the rate of bimolecular reactions is given by this formula. People tried this formula. Guess what? It didn't work. It really overestimated how many, how fast the reaction was. And what they found is they had to put in some type of factor, which they called the steric factor, rho. This arises because only certain collision geometries lead to reaction. So people now got a knowledge of rho. And rho can be quite small, like 0.01. Okay, depends. And so this leads to the idea of steric hindrance in chemical reactions. And so this is the beginning of what we know about rho. How can we go beyond this? Okay. To gain a deeper understanding, it is necessary to examine individual collisions and get away from molecular velocity and internal state distributions caused by temperature averaging. The temperature really gets in our way. And this realization ushered in the era of molecular beam research for which many Nobel prizes in chemistry have been awarded. The idea is now try to look at single collisions uh, and the effect of many of them, but one at a time. And, uh, and I, I wanted to share with you the most, I think the most celebrated example of what is called reaction stereodynamics. And this is when a beam of potassium K strikes uh, an oriented beam of methyl iodide, uh, CH3I, okay? We expect it's gonna form Ki plus the methyl radical. Uh, and uh, indeed, people look at this Ki, they can detect this product, and, and you'll see it as a function of angle as shown here. And in, 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 indeed, this is the heavier thing, so it's gonna bounce back. And uh, you, you're going to see it on two configurations, one called favorable, one called unfavorable. By using an electric field, you can make it such that the CH3 end points towards K, in which case you have unfavorable, or you can make the I end of methyl iodide point towards K of the symmetric top. And uh, indeed, this is a, a beautiful example. Now you might say, how is it possible at all that the CH3 end can react? Remember the molecules, can also go around the side. And this system also has the ability to have an electron jump to start to go to K plus and I minus as it goes on to Ki. So it's more complicated than it first might appear. But okay, uh, we have an idea of it and a very good example. Now I wanna tell you about cold collision dynamics. And this is done by, by three people in my group. The leader of this group who's done so much is Dr. Nandini Mukherjee. Uh, shown here. Uh, she trained two graduate students. Now, one of them, Willie stayed on, Willie Perot, and uh, he, he's done a great deal of the work, a great instrumentalist. And Mr. Howen Joe is now getting his PhD, is going to defend his PhD in, in probably in a couple of weeks from now. And I'm, I'm delighted that uh, the U.S. Army Research Office has been supporting this work. Okay. So this, of course, now starts to poach, broach the question, does the chemistry world care about cold collisions? Well, honestly, most of the world does not. But those who want to really understand how chemical reactions occur do pay attention. And I thought I would quote to you from uh, a friend, Javier Awith in, in Spain, uh, who wrote, um, when experiment challenges theory, scattering of vibrationally excited molecules in the cold collision energy regime. And this is a publication of his that appeared uh, 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 in 2021. So it's fairly recent. Okay. And I'm going to read to you what he wrote. The last decade has, been, has seen substantial advances in the exploration of inelastic and reactive collisions at collision energies 
in the cold, that means about one less than one degree K, and ultra cold, less than one millikelvin uh, regime. And these advances ushered in an understanding of cold and ultra cold collisions that is impacting research areas ranging from molecular spectroscopy to quantum simulation. And people have dreams about making uh, quantum computers, as you've certainly heard, heard about. Cold collisions are dominated by resonances, okay? As amply manifest in most of the systems studied. Without a resonance, you just don't have much that happens. Resonances are also present in the thermal and hyperthermal collision energy regimes, but obscured by background, non resonance scattering, and the presence of many partial waves or different waves, different collisions with different orbital angular momentum pertaining to higher angular momenta that blur the partial waves' individual contributions. How can we get away from this? Make the system very cold. And now I need to explain to you how we control things. And this is going to be adiabatic state preparation through a technique that's going to be uh, uh, very much uh, stark uh, induced adiabatic uh, Raman um, uh, um, uh, uh, pumping of systems, preparation of systems. Okay, and I I'm going to show you here how this goes. These are two pulses, and I have them in two different colors here to show you. We need two laser beams. Uh, this is an optical field of the, of the pump laser. This is an optical field of, the, of another dump laser or Stokes laser, although it can both go up, up, it's also possible. This is gonna be the field-induced detuning. The, the uh, laser has enough electric field power that it actually makes a stark shift. And this omega is going to be the two photon Rabi frequency. And these are the eigen energies of the adiabatic states. We're going to connect two states between them. And we can go up and down and connect two states in this process. And uh, here is actually the, the setup. Before I do this, let me explain. I want to study things like H2. H2 has no dipole allowed transitions. Why not? It's a homonuclear diatomic molecule. There is a quadrupole allowed transition, but that's so weak that maybe only on Jupiter can you see such things very easily, otherwise not, okay? How are we gonna pump the H2? Well, Raman can get us only so far. We can just have Raman scattering, but we wanna do something more. We're gonna go, go up and down as I'm gonna show you. And uh, I now gotta get a sh give you the idea of the experimental setup. It involves actually three different laser beams. Two of these laser beams are actually coherent single mode lasers and that they're actually offset in time from each other, which you can do, of course, easily by changing distances. And here that's shown the green and the red uh, beams. And this is a pulse sequence. Here is our molecular beam in, a, in an evacuated chamber. And then we're going to send in a, a little bit later another pulse uh, uh, often in the in the UV, which will cause multi-photon ionization. This is going to be resonance-enhanced multi-photon ionization to turn our neutral products into ions so that we can do a time-of-flight detector and, and, and pick them up. This is the experimental setup. Uh, and uh, it's indeed a, takes a, more than one person to make this thing work. Uh, I want to go through the, the idea of how this goes. I'm telling you, we go from V equals zero up to a virtual state, and we have another frequency coming down to whatever V prime we're going to. This is going to be to try to pump molecules. Maybe I should stop and ask people, how, how well can you pump molecules? And um, the first thought is, well, maybe you can, if you saturate, get up to 50%. The reason you can't get better than 50% is whatever brings you up uh, also can bring you back down. So you just can't get more than 50%. And getting even 50% is very hard, uh, but, 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 but possible. I want to show you how you can get 100% and, 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 and for specific levels. And here is our, here's our setup. This is a two-photon, two-state adiabatic system. So here are our two states, one and two. And I, here's one. Okay, and 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 uh, we, we want to connect them, and uh, here is of course the 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 uh, the Schrodinger equation, 
And this is what it looks like, uh, where this omega R is the two photon Rabi frequency. And this delta is going to be detuning from resonance because it's very important that we actually have a powers involved in the detuning to make this work. And if we now solve this, it's, it's, it's just solve it for its, for its eigenvalues. This is an easy quadratic equation to solve. Trust me, here's its formula. And you, you can see this right away that it's a quadratic equation, right? And you, you get two solutions, uh, an upper state and lower state that you're getting from this. And these are the eigenstates of the time-dependent Hamiltonian. And I'm showing you the delta T. And this delta T is a function of T because it's going to change with the intensity of the laser pulse. And uh, this is now actually solving it for what, what you can see as we go through this. That's why actually in some sense, okay, it's easy to give a lecture and talk about this. But what you want to do is you really want to study it if you get into it. Here's the delta change and, 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 and that, that we're after. And, and these are the real uh, eigenvalues for the system here. Okay, um, fine. And now I'm going to show you, this is the pump pulse. This is the Stokes that brings us back down. And this is now the overlap, the product of the two that looks like this. You need to offset them. If you put them together, you would go up and down as much as, 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 much as before. And this is actually watching how the energy changes, levels one, levels two. And we're going to show you that we can arrange this to put all the population that was in one into level two. And here we go. So let's recall the nature of motion on, on two potential surfaces that cross, okay? If the motion is slow, no coupling occurs when the states come close to each other or cross. If the motion is fast, the population will be mixed between the two states. So let's watch what happens. Here we go, and it's slow, and we bring it all the way along, and we bring it all the way to that state. Now, th that's great, and this is watching the population of N2 change in time. And there's wiggles in this when you do it all quantum mechanically. It isn't perfect, but it's very close, okay? Now, what happens if instead, your system looks like this. What happens is fine, it still goes long, but when it comes to this, it now bifurcates, it goes both ways. That's why we get these oscillations and we don't get 100% like we did before. Let's go back again, okay? Notice that, that went from zero to one, okay? This one does not. And so we understand now how to do this, okay? To avoid dependence on pulse area, we exploit the abiotic change in the energies of the two states due to the interaction of the electric field of an intense light pulse with the two-level system. The energy of each state changes in time. By partially overlapping two pulses of unequal intensity, we generate one avoided crossing, giving nearly 100% population transfer. That's the trick. And that's why this is such a powerful technique. It allows any molecule to move it to a vibrational rotational level from starting from the cooled cold ground state in a supersonic expansion. And moreover, we've actually done multiple SARP, double SARP, and you can go on to yet uh, arbitrarily high vibrational levels this way. Uh, now, they to explain another effect, uh, which I, many of you are familiar with, namely polarization and what it can do, the electric field. This is gonna be the M state, the magnetic sub-level sub state, preparation to control molecular alignment. And depending how you line it up, I can select everything so that I go from M equals zero, a delta M equals zero to, with polarized light to another delta M equals zero. And if I make them, the, the two pulses have the same polarization in this direction, this looks like this, and I'm gonna call that when it's horizontal, I'm gonna call that H sharp, and that's gonna be along the direction of the molecular beam, which moves the way my pointer is moving here. On the other hand, I could now make the, the, uh, the electric field this way. Then I can get something called V sharp. I can be even more delish about it and do one in one direction and one in the other and get all entangled states. But that's another talk I don't wanna get into right now, though it's interesting, okay?
I just want to look at this. We can do H sharp and V sharp. Okay. And so let's look what happens. This is before state preparation. Okay. And we cooled it. This is going to be a pure D2 beam. We're going to cool it. Uh, our deuterium, okay, heavy hydrogen, supersonic expansion, J equals zero, J equals one, J equals two. It really falls off, J equals three. And there's 38% in V equals zero, J equals zero. Now, let's do the SARP technique. After state preparation, this goes from about 38% back to 2%. That means 36% has been moved. We've nearly done 100% population, big number, okay, that has been put into this state. We can measure that. Though we have some of these others hanging around still, haven't touched them because we have not made a perfect beam preparation in this. Okay, next idea. Uh, this is an, a very important idea. Uh, one that I, I started thinking about when I was actually a, a graduate student. And uh, I'm, I'm afraid you see this on the road all the time. You, you know, um, cars move on the road and some cars rear end the other car, okay? Because they're going faster than the other car in front of them. Often the other car in front of them puts on the brakes and the person in the back doesn't realize that and slams into the car. We're going to do the same thing in a molecular beam. People often claim, oh, molecular beams are collision free. That's a false statement. They make collisions, not many, but they make collisions within themselves. So we're going to have a collision taking place in which fast molecules overcome slow molecules if we have a distribution of speeds. And we expect, therefore, they scatter at some angle, theta, like shown here. And uh, indeed, we will get a different, if we look at the time of flight arrival, it'll be related to this. And, and by looking at the time of flight system, okay, we'll be able to determine what is the angle from the profile of the time of flight. So VS is the lab velocity of the scatter D2, that's really high. Okay, VB is the most probable molecular beam speed in the lab frame. Again, very high. The molecules are being cooled, but they're going very fast in the lab. But in the center of mass, they're going quite slow, as you'll see. The, the speed of the scattered D2 in the center of mass frame, not big. Okay, and uh, th this theta is the polar angle relative to the lab fixed time of flight axis in the center of mass, which I'm thinking to be in this direction. That's where I'm choosing the Z direction to be horizontal. What does it mean? Conclusion, measurement of the D2 plus, okay, I'm using REMPI to make the D2 into D2 plus, resonance enhanced multi-photon ionization. The time of flight velocity distribution gives the D2 plus angular distribution. And I now wanna get across again, the experimental setup to you before showing you any results. Here's our pumps, our stokes that I'd mentioned to you. Here's how we're, we're changing J2, M equals zero. We're bringing it along this way. And uh, this is what I mentioned to you. And now you understand the polarization of this beam however we do it, okay? Whether it's gonna be along the beam or perpendicular to the beam, we can make V SARP and H SARP both. And we're gonna actually start by looking at rotational relaxation. We're going to prepare the D2 in a particular state. We're going to make it into V equals two, actually, and J equals two. J is the rotation, V is the vibration. And then we're going to look at collisions that end up with being J equals two and M equals something or other, okay? Uh, zero is what we're going to look at in, in this process. And uh, we're going to look at this cold scattering. Let me start, if I might, by asking about what are the forces involved when you have a D2 molecule um, colliding with another D2 molecule. If you'll forgive me, I'm going to take a break for a moment and come back and let you think about this. How do you think quadrupoles interact with each other?
Uh, okay, I'm, I'm back. So let's try to make a simple intuitive picture for quadrupole, quadrupole scattering. First of all, the, the AD2 molecule has no dipole, but it does have a quadrupole. Where's the quadrupole come from? The fact that the electrons, of course, go to the, in a D2 molecule, go towards the center, right? Because that's where we get binding. We all understand that in terms of the sigma orbital when it overlaps. So that means the ends are positive and the middle is negative. That's what it looks like. Here's a D2 molecule. And look at VSARP. This is going to collide with this. Okay. And as they come together, they they basically they may be some attraction, but they by and large bounce off each other. That's the nature of VSARP. And this is now for an impact parameter, in that, which is not just lined up perfectly center to center, but they're offset. The difference between here and here in distance is what we call the impact parameter B, okay? And of course, we're gonna average over all impact parameters. We don't control it. Look at the difference though, if we do H SARP, they come together. Now they're both moving this way, but notice this repels this and that causes this to start to rotate, okay? And this is being pushed up too. But now this is going towards this, and you, and th this is moving towards this, and they're going to actually, depending, they're going to much more interact with each other. We have a different geometry. This is what I was telling you about a steric effect. Uh, uh, We're uh, going to uh, see how Dick, big th this Dick, might be. I, Dick? Yes? Can I ask a question? Yeah. What are the, what are the energetics? What is the kind of energy we are talking here? The, so I am I am talking about temperatures on the order of a few degrees Kelvin. Okay. And if you and velocities that are on the order of like hundred meters per second, nothing more. Really mm -hmm. low, cold mm -hmm. in the center of mass. In the lab, they're moving very fast. Mm. Okay? okay. And uh, now I want to show you the result. Oops, it went past the result. So here, here we are. I'm showing you H sharp and V sharp, and they're very different, uh, and in terms of of their time of flight, and in terms of their their this is the time of flight in in terms of the uh, uh, nanoseconds to arrive. This is how we're getting a profile and what it is how we get the angular distribution from this. This is a schematic drawing of the sharp preparation of the molecular beam. That's the orange spot. Okay, it's about 100 microns. As the delay is increased, this spot propagates. Notice it's moving. And it spreads. Okay, I have different speeds. Volume, which is much smaller, a little purple circle here of about 20 microns are detected. Now it says, my, it says I'm, okay. And this is now the relative H sharp that's the red dots and VSARP, blue dots. Please notice that around 50 nanoseconds or whatever, there's a huge difference. It's about a factor of, I don't know, three and a half, as I read it, um, between the two. This is a big steric effect uh, that we're seeing. And, they, and um, the error bars represent one standard deviation. And we're really seeing now molecules that are colliding with themselves that are both being aligned. So there's a large steric effect that favors H sharp over V sharp as, as intuitively expected from what I showed you, okay? And um, the velocity distribution is measured within the REMPI probe volume as a function of delay, okay? This is a, a let's look at these, okay? Is the schematic of the SARP preparation. We've talked about that before. B is the velocity distribution at 50 nanoseconds. So this is the D2, V equals two, J equals two, and the D2 V equals two, J equals zero is in black. They're very, very similar, aren't they, at this point? And they are starting to move much more when we get to, this one's at 200 nanoseconds, okay? And the collision speeds for both the aligned, uh, 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 red, uh, red and blue, and aligned, unaligned, black and purple collision pairs at the two different, um, the delays that are allowing us to start to separate them and, and see the effect. 
Um, and to understand this velocity narrowing, we must consider that both SARP preparation and REMPI detection take place within the narrow confines of the focused laser spots on the D2 molecular beam and have interaction times of only a, a few nanoseconds. And so SARP sets a time, a clock, time equals zero, for preparing the D2 V equals two, J equals two molecules. And afterwards, the state prepared molecules with different velocities will disperse in space along the molecular beam. Uh, that's the increasing orange blur that we're seeing here. And, but the detection of this by, by REMPI acts as a temporal gate that sets a narrow time window for the SARP prepared molecules to arrive at the probe location, make a collision, and have the collision product ionized. And because of this gating action, the velocity distribution is increasingly narrowed as the detection um, delay time is increased. And we're actually achieving what I think is a, a, one of the dreams that people have. How do I align two molecules and watch them when they collide? And that's what we're doing. And to me, that's the first experiment that I know of, of its type. And I'm again here defining for you what is the impact parameter B of bringing these together, as we see. And I need to get you to understand the resonance. The resonance comes from, here's the potential, here's some type of potential curve. It comes from the fact that it is possible to form a temporary bound state by tunneling through, through this little centrifugal barrier, okay? At, at, at certain energies, but we're very cold. So we have only a small number of partial waves that can contribute. And here we are, we're looking at the collision speed distribution for the D2 pairs at 50 nanoseconds and at 600 nanoseconds. And then we're, we're over here looking at what different L's can contribute. And I'm showing you this dashed line. Let's, let's go through this. The contour lines for the orbital angular momentum, that's, a little, that's a, a script L. L equals one, solid orange. L equals two is solid purple, okay? Uh, and the next is solid green. And they keep moving away as a function of the collision speed and impact parameter. And, the, and we expect that you, you can't have very high Ls. They just never get close enough, okay? Because of the impact parameter. Remember that L is mu V rel B. Mu is the reduced mass, V is the relative velocity and the center mass and B is the impact parameter. So they're all related to each other this way. And now you can make a partial wave analysis of scattering angular distribution. And indeed, Nandini Mukherjee did, did this very much. And I'm not gonna go through the math, except we, we, we average over all fee dependence. We just have a detector that looks at time of arrival and not as to what fee angle, what uh, azimuthal angle. And uh, this is how well she's able to fit this. And she th th believes that it all comes primarily from L equals two. The solid black and dashed black curves represent fits with even L and wow, they work. And if you try odd, oh, it's a failure, big failure. So we're very convinced now we're not only seeing a resonance, but that it is very much related um, to an even L process. I thought I'd show you now the most recent work on this. And this is of course what she found in terms of the L's that it's being dominated. And um, uh, so here it is, it was published in 2022. And we tuned the collision energy using the velocity dispersion of the molecular beam in, com in com combination with this laser gating. And we see a dramatic changes in the scattering rate of the collision energy is tuned. When the bond axis of both D2 molecules are aligned parallel to the collision velocity, the scattering rate drops by a factor of 3.5 as collision energies less than 2.1 K are removed. <coughs> we made a partial wave analysis and we think it's primarily L equals two is what we said. Now, here is more work. This work has been submitted to physical review letters and I expect it'll soon be accepted. Um, and again, this is work of my friend, Javier Ruiz. Uh, his, here's his student who has now his own faculty position and it's been helped very much by these people, Hua Guo and, and uh, Bella, Bella uh, who's been working with this and getting the potentials and the scattering as well. And what do they find? They've looked at it in more detail and I'm showing you this 
as a function of the of the temperature, and they're seeing an L equals two resonance. But look, an L equals four, very strong. Uh, is the, they so they think that's also very important uh, in the process. But 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 not the other Ls. And here they're showing you how they put things together. This is showing you the D two with D two, both J equals two. And that that and and here's the the green is the L equals four. The the orange is um, if you get cold enough, you, 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 but this becomes more important. And they're showing you now what happens if you look at the stuff that's not been pumped. You pick up this, but it's at yet higher energy. And so they've tried to put all this together, and I'll show you the result. Here's what they find. Here is very much what they see. The red dots with air bars are our experimental measurements. And here they are actually looking at the velocity average differential rates for D2 V equals 2 J equals 0 production normalized by the square of the total intensity of D2. And as I say, uh, 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 the results of our calculations are sh of theirs, they're talking about theirs, are shown as a solid black curves, while the experimental results of, of uh, Howen, Joe, and others are shown in red dots for H sharp and blue dots for V sharp. Here's V sharp, here's H sharp. And we really are developing a very good understanding of this. And we see that it's not easy to simply describe at all the steric effects at these low temperatures. They're very quantum mechanical, as you might expect. Things are very wave-like when you make them that slow, okay? And I, I think this shows you the progress in the field and the exciting possibilities that cold collisions can really start to probe and get at steric effects that we know are there, but, but I think uh, all of us have not had the chance to really look at in such high detail. Uh, there, there's much excitement to be and much to be learned still by looking at these collisions in very cold temperatures, something that you first wouldn't imagine. And no, we're not going to put anything in a bottle this way. Okay. And so some people in chemistry will be very disappointed. But for those who are seeking a real understanding of what happens in collisions and even uh, uh, inelastic and reactive, this, this is going to be a very much a, a new future for the field. I, I thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Let's see, I'll escape this now if I can. Yeah. Let's see, how, how do I get back to seeing you? Aha. Let me just go here and move this up. Okay. I'm stop sharing screen. Okay. And so this gives you some idea of this work. And uh, again, it, it's it's very much I've had a wonderful time. And, and and I very much appreciate the chances I've had to be with uh, Kankan Bhattacharya and, and to have this chance to talk to you to, to uh, this evening. Dick, Thank you so much. Dick, can yeah. you can, can 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 will you be able to uh, answer some some questions? I don't know if I can answer them, but I'd be glad to try. No, no, I mind. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I think there will be some questions, and I think. Uh, Professor Pratik Shen uh, will, uh, will, will, will pass on the questions to you. Pratik, are you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. There. So if there is any question, I mean, either you can raise your hand and ask one by one. Not too many because Professor Jay must be very tired. I can, can I ask a question? Yeah, please, Professor Bakshi. Yeah. So, Dick, this is a wonderful, really amazing talk. And, you know, it is this... Uh, Fluorescence resonance is actually field created by you, right? Uh, now, uh, so the steric effects that we always in physical chemistry textbooks, whenever we get the pre exponential factor, now that is also connected to entropy sometimes. Uh, so if, if I have to think of them, do I need to think that? Uh, uh, it is uh, mm, that this sum total of static effects, uh, sum total of static effects, if I can map out, I go towards the entropy when temperature comes in. I know 
you are doing at a very low temperature where entropy probably is not important. Well, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking at a, a single collision events in right. this case. Mm -hmm. And entropy tends to be when we want to do ensemble averages to me, uh, when we talk about the whole, whole a collection of them. Do, mm -hmm. do you agree with that? Right, talking? absolutely. So, so you are picking out what particular orientation of collision that is going to be important, right? In a single collision. Right, right. And I, I'm showing you there's a real difference when you, when you collide these molecules in different ways. Different orientations, and they 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 uh, inelastically scatter. Mm. Uh, this may not be the most interesting thing to study. I mean, I, you know, the, there are chemical reactions that are more important, but which we know that really are big steric effects, and bulky groups hide things, and and various things to the sort. Um, and uh, but we're seeing how we're able to start to get to, to, to study these now in much more detail, and, you, you and see of course relate this very much to the potential. It's uh, the reason that of course hydrogen and helium are picked is they have so few electrons, so that people who do the uh, ab initio calculations can make very accurate potentials. That's the idea. Hmm. I I think I failed to say that in the beginning, so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay, so any other questions by anybody? So looks like there is I, no other question. No, uh, yeah, yeah, Professor Shatamurti. Yeah, uh, if you'll permit, I don't, I don't have a specific question at this time. Dick, it was wonderful listening to you. Such a challenging experiment. And uh, uh, I, I look forward to reading your paper and I will write to you asking for more details. Well, th thank, 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 thank you. Th these are truly very difficult experiments. I, I wanted you to, 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 anytime you have three lasers, you have to continue to make run. <laughs> uh, I, as well yeah. as vacuum equipment and the rest, you're, you're, you, you, you have a struggle. And, uh, uh, can I ask can't be uh, done a, by a one kind person? Of, a kind of, can I ask a kind of silly question? Uh, Please. Uh, when we are doing a postdoc with the, this two arise group, then there's a lot of talk. They did an experiments and there was some difficulties of the rotational level dependence of electronic luxation. Uh, that I think has been fixed. That has been kind of settled, right? Because you, you, are, you are doing such accurate rotational dependence uh, in, in going to M equal to two, J equal to two, right? Uh, so that is yeah. what is very, very difficult. Mm. Cor correct. You, you, you don't get this under normal circumstances. It's there, but it's being averaged over many other things that are there. That's, right. that's what's happening. Yeah. And so we're not taking it apart to look at individual such effects. Yeah. Yeah, this is really amazing. And, yeah. and um, <laughs> yeah. um, why the Army Research Office supports this is a mystery to me. Don't ask that question. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, but they, they always support these kind of fundamental things. You know, they have something, some hidden agenda. Yeah. Yeah. But I think people are intrigued this idea by the idea that someday they're going to be able to do quantum computing, and they need to be able to, to handle. They need so to know very cold. Level. Yeah, they need to know very cold. Yes, for yes. coherence. Yes. Uh, so I think that's what's driving some people. Also, it's, it proves a very good check on how well we, we really understand theory at this point. Right, right, right. That's what Dartley Harsbeck, Dartley Harsbeck and Yearly work at that time also, you know. They, they had the potential, they had the potential as the surface, but they didn't have any data. Uh, yeah. So, yes. Okay, so uh, looks like there is no other question. So, Please join me in thanking Professor Zayar for wonderful. Well, I thank you all very much for and of your course patience. for the first Tonkan Bhattacharya Memorial Lecture. Yeah, I I think uh, I'll, thank I'll, you for I'll the... proceeding back to Professor Bachchi for his Thank comment. you very much. Yeah, I've been uh, here is wonderful. But anytime you know, just see and listen to Professor Zayar is such a treat. You know, it, it is something kind of a he has a gift clearly. And uh, to be able to excite people, one of the most exciting scientists that I've seen. Uh, we were 
the, this using this as a uh, to create a platform uh, uh, and this occasion is to also discuss the little bit that a kind of thing on con myself and also Ronjit and uh, uh, on in the, we discussed some kind of physical chemistry platform uh, some society of physical chemistry for India and uh, so if we can do that and we'll be if we are able to do that the next memorial lecture will be uh, from that or, or under that auspices of that kind of society because we want to keep it uh, going and we have made a fantastic beginning uh, with Professor Diggs. They are kindly give this lecture so such an awful time and we are also uh, very sorry for this thing, the, the, the little thing happened. Uh, but, but after all, it has been a successful and thanks to Professor Zaya, this wonderful lecture which is so, so exciting. And uh, so I think I'll now, I'll now uh, hand it over to Shaptarshi. Uh, Shaptarshi will, will close up this thing. Shaptarshi, are you there? Yes, yes, sir. Hmm. So thank you, Professor Bhakji. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to give the vote of thanks. At the outset, uh, please let me thank Professor Zair for accepting our invitation to deliver the first Professor Kankan Bhattacharya Memorial Lecture. Just to give you a brief genesis of this, uh, it was just an informal discussion with Professor Bhakji, Professor Aninda Datta, Professor Sovan Sen, uh, my friend Pratik, and, uh, and myself. So uh, that day we were thinking of starting as Professor Bhakti just mentioned, that we should start some forum for physical chemistry in India. And uh, then we just came up with the idea that uh, 10th December happens to be the birthday of Professor Bhattacharya. So why not start it on that day? It is still very in its infancy stage, uh, but we thought that who can be a better person than Professor Zair to start the initiatives for us. So I'm not thanking Professor Bhagji because to me, I think he was the closest person to Professor Bhattacharya. So I'm not using the word thank you, sir. We are indebted to you for taking the initiative. Thanks to, of course, my uh, members from the same lab, uh, Professor Ananda Datta, Professor Sovan Sen, Professor Pratik Sen, and of course, Professor Ranjit Biswas, Shumon, Rajib. They really helped us a lot to have the first memorial lecture. We thank all the friends of Professor Bhattacharya who are here. I'm not taking any names because I fear I might miss someone. So thank you all for attending this lecture. And uh, the well wishers, the students, I know the students miss him a lot. He was there for them always to kind of rekindle the spark. And uh, with this, we look forward to the second lecture under the KB or Kankan Bhattacharya Memorial Lecture Series. So I once again thank you all and especially Professor Zair for taking the time. I know you're traveling, uh, Professor Zair, tomorrow. Have a safe uh, trip to India. And uh, with this, I think uh, by permissions of all, we thank you all and uh, we can close this session and we look forward to have you in the second Kankan Bhattacharya Memorial Lecture. Thank you. See you soon, Dick. See yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, Dick. Thanks. Uh, bye.